What's going on, Reef Builders? I'm Jake Adams. I got my fellow Reef Therapist, Mark Vanderwall, in the house. Um, how you doing, Mark? Doing good, man. Had a good day. Ready for good. another deep discussion? Yeah. Um, I just want to let everybody know uh, we've been really hitting the pavement as far as this reef therapy uh, format is concerned. Um, we put together a really nice logo for reef therapy. I'm very happy with it. I'm sure we'll come up with some merch down the road. But more importantly, um, this is the format that really lends itself well to just listening because we're not showing anything other than our face on, on YouTube. Um, so I think we're already on Spotify. And uh, we just got approved by Apple, so we'll be in the Apple Music or whatever they're calling it this decade. And I'm sure everything else is uh, shortly behind it. So um, if you're not subscribed to YouTube, go ahead and hit, hit the link there. And, uh, but if you want to hear us, um, I guess, without seeing our, our pretty visages, go ahead and uh, check out your favorite podcatcher. Um, if we're not there yet, we'll be there very soon. And... Um, so we really kind of kicked off the whole reef therapy sessions um, probably with a strong focus on, on hardware and, and equipment because that's something that Mark and I have always discussed a lot. So we thought we'd take a nice hard left turn into um, animal land and livestock. And my wife works at an aquarium store and she tells me all the time that people will look at certain corals and at certain frags and ask what its what its name is not what what it what the coral actually is but if it doesn't have some fancy made up trade name they're immediately deflated <laughs> immediately deflated i'm like if you like the coral if you like the color if you have some confidence that you can keep that animal alive then just go for it, it doesn't matter what it's called cuz it's it's not even real well if you asked about the coral you clearly liked it right i mean at that point who cares so this entire episode is going to be devoted to underrated livestock fish inverts and i figured we'd end with corals because that's going to be a nice long rabbit hole and uh did you have some ideas i, I know i kind of put this in your ear just a couple days ago um what did you what's your overall thought on overrated and underrated livestock oh <clears throat> i think uh people put a lot of hype on if something is rare um or hard to get you know and and uh i don't know i i, I think if you're excited about the reason that it's rare in the sense that it comes from a interesting geographic location right mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. then yeah by all means that's great right but um if you're just you know y you you see some of the hype build up around the rarity of i mean if we're going to stick to fish and uh invertebrates first um i i do think that sometimes uh the the how do i put it the focus ends up being on the rarity uh, of the thing that i that that you know, like that's why you think it's cool versus it's a it's an interesting organism to have in your tank or it's, you know, pretty. Um, the example I always wanted to use, but it's not really good for the times anymore, was the yellow tang versus gem tang comparison. Mm -hmm. I always felt like the yellow tang was one of the most underappreciated fish, not in the sense of I mean, it's like everybody had a yellow tang. It was like the clownfish of tangs, right? Like everybody had one. So it's not like it was ignored, but I didn't ever feel like people appreciated it. Like they just saw it like it was a $20 fish. It's not, it's not just the color for me. Yeah. It's also the uniformity, the vibrance, yeah. the saturation of the color. But that alone isn't enough. There are some bright yellow fish. For me, it's that perfect spade shape of yellow tangs. I'm really glad this is where we're starting out because uh, um, I just picked up a 15 year old 10 inch black tang. He's been in captivity for 15 years and he's almost jet black. And he went from a four by eight foot long kind of coral holding tank to a four foot tank that's 18 inches wide. 
And you could just tell this guy has been key, you know, he's been in aquariums longer than most people have kept aquariums. Just the behavior from when he, he, he dropped it in the tank. But I love all the zebra somas. And to be honest, like the black is probably my least favorite when they get larger because they get kind of like a funky elongated shape and they get like a weird silver streak. But this guy doesn't have that problem. But yeah, yellow tangs, scopus, I think purples especially. Mm. I, I don't know why I'm the only person I think that has discussed and really observed the different spots and stripes of purple tangs. If you see enough of them, you, you realize like there's some diversity there that you, yeah. can, you can see up close. Yeah, and just, I mean, I, I'm this is obviously a personal preference thing, but uh, a healthy, like a thriving, healthy, well-fed yellow tang to me is always a sight to behold. I always think that's just an amazing fish. Like if you're a, an outsider, going into a fish store or you know going to somebody's house and they've got a reef tank that's one of those fish that everyone sees and and notices right um of course now they're more scarce uh yeah. and uh you know they're they, they they have the hype of the rarity uh behind them as well now so it's oh, it's weird it's it's like such a mixed blessing because they are being captive bred and it's i know that they've really been working to refine the quality of the f the yellow tangs that are exported and you know we'll move off of yellow tangs here in a second yeah. but i do want to get this out that um when clownfish were first being bred there was a lot of pushback because they weren't as colorful they were smaller they were more expensive they were um not just not as colorful and I mean, it takes a long time to really perfect that out. And what's funny now is like, nobody even wants most wild clownfish yeah. and all the diseases they might bring in. And to be honest, man, like some of the clownfish producers, uh, they are brighter orange than the wild ones. Have you ever kind of noticed that yeah. to any degree? Yeah. The only wild, uh, I, I guess, perculas that I've always I, I wish we could sometimes still find, and maybe they're out there. Are the uh, the true, true? I know you were gonna say that. Yeah, I knew Solomon you were say Island that. perks. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, when I w so this kind of ties back into the zebra somas too. Uh, when I was younger, obviously I had um, like some saddlebacks and I had some ocellaris clownfish. And back then, the it clownfish was a, a true percula percula clownfish. You know. Yep. And. And same thing, so like you know, one of my first like favorite books was the Daniel Knopp uh, Giant Clam book. And there was gem tangs all up in there because Europe had a lot uh, easier access to the uh, Western Indian Ocean. And I was like, oh my God, that's a dream fish. And uh, maybe about two years ago, I didn't get one gem tang. I got four at the same time. But now I have over 20 yellow tangs because every time I see a used one at a fish store, before you know Hawaii shut down, I just had to have them, and uh, so now pretty much the only thing missing from my stables, I think, is uh, I have a solid yellow Scopus tang. I need to go ahead and get both sail fins uh, because why not? And captive bred yellow tangs. I'm probably going to get some captive bred yellow tangs here soon, and I'm looking forward to seeing the progress that they've made through the captive breeding. But uh, continue on with the point that you were making between the yellows and the gems. No, I just. Um so i mean i i yeah i i went down the same level of appreciation with gem tangs back in the day um i remember going on a scuba trip in south africa mozambique and you know seeing one and i wasn't expecting to see it there because you know everything i read was they weren't there they were uh what is it um mauritius mauritius yeah so you know this i don't know if this guy was just like a stray but um so I, I have a, I have some sentimentality with gem tanks from from those type of experiences, but I you know personally speaking, if they were the same value, I would I would put my money on a yellow tang any day. Oh yeah, um, oh yeah, just not even close. Just I, I, you know because I I I, I take this uh, uh, challenge at both ends. 
I really love the, like the super common stuff. There's a reason that like some of these iconic fish, like clownfish and certain fish, um, certain gobies and harasses are super popular. But on the flip side, I also love the super exotic stuff, but not usually related to price. Kind of going back to what you started saying about geography. When a fish comes from a certain place and you can look at it and think about, oh, this, uh, you know, Cocoa Peel Angel fish was from this, you know, Christmas Island Indian Ocean or uh, gem tangs or, you know, from the Mauritius or a certain fish from the Red Sea. Um, that's, that's another layer of appreciation that I think takes a long time to develop. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I just think that, you know, when people do post their gem tangs and everything, uh, I don't think their motive is maybe in that place, right? Like, I think their excitement is just because of the price tag that it was. Um, it's so funny how a oh man, a gem tang just five years ago was probably like $2,500. Yeah, they've gone down they in price. Well, they were coming in piecemeal from Mauritius, like yeah. just a few here and there. But I don't think they occur in Mauritius because I've been diving in Mauritius. And we, I was there, I don't know, four or five days. We saw two tiny babies. But I have been diving in KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. And what I wanted to see when I was out there was tiger angelfish. And I saw two in the wild and then one in an aquarium. But on one of my dives, bro, I'll never forget this. I... I plopped in the water and as soon as like the bubbles just kind of you know floated off my mask all i saw were gem tangs the size of dinner plates just i mean first of all it was 65 degrees so it was like almost cold water it was super surgy there was there was no other fish there was no other surgeon fish was that uh ollywall shoal or was that yeah, it was uh, Shoal? Yep. yeah 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 it was kind of kind of crazy that is um, a crazy crazy dive for us folks used to caribbean style cattle mm -hmm. boat diving like i felt like super i was a navy seal <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. The, the 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 boats like kind of breaching the huge waves. Um, yeah. What do they call those inflatables? I guess maybe just inflatables. Yeah. And or I whatever. remember resting on the bottom and watching my depth gauge vary by fifteen feet because <laughs> the swells were so huge yeah. where we were diving. It, it wasn't a lot of current, but it was a lot of swell. Um, but yeah, I mean, the surgeon fish. You know, while we're talking about the surgeon fish, when they're brought into captivity. They're really small, and it's hard to, especially all the different esoteric uh, Acanthura species, uh, flower, fowl, Fowleri, Maculiceps, Berrien. It's not until they're like a good foot yeah. to a foot and a half that they really start to, to, to see and appreciate their full adult coloration. Yeah, that's a... I've never gone down that road just because I've never had... I felt a tank big enough to accommodate fish like that i'm there with you um but yeah I, th that's a that's like a bucket list group of fish right there i even i'd say the same for any nasos right it's uh um i've never had a tank large enough that i f would feel comfortable keeping one i guess long term i've um, only had a flamingi because i got him when he was like two inches at a time when they were like $500 and they were only being imported from Palau. I was selling them for $500 and 99 at the, at the Marine Fish in yeah. Marietta, Georgia. And, but I, I was able to find a small one in the, in, you know, just kind of mixed in with some other batches. Now you can get them all day long, but that's the only one I've ever kept. Oh my God, they're so freaking friendly. They're like, <laughs> they're like dogs, man, they're like pets. Um, but, um, you know, some other surgeon fish that I really love, I have one in almost every single tank, is Tomini. Mm. In good Tomini tangs and convict tangs. People That's on my list, man. I got a little list right here, uh, and oh, I wrote nice. down convict tang. I got one. I've got my second one now, and I don't understand why you don't see those in tanks more because... They are they're, the they're literally the tank. cheapest fish. They're the cheapest surgeon fish on our price list. Cheaper than Tomini, cheaper than the Scopus. Yeah, yeah, it's it's convict tank. Um, well, and what I like about them, and somebody out there is going to completely disagree with me about this, but in my experience, they're not very territorial, um, mm -hmm. and they just graze all day long. Like they're too busy to pick a fight because they're just grazing your tank all day long. 
Um, I um, my my go to algae cleanup crew for everything for every tank. I mean, I've got five six tanks here that each have at least one yellow tang or zebra sum of some kind. Um, one Tomini and one Convict. I like having those three different mouths, right? The Cantharis is kind of a generalist. The uh, bristle mouth tangs have a bristle mouth, like the Tomini. And then your zebra sum has got that, you know, little pincher nose, like they really can get in between stuff. But, um, yeah, you know, it's, it goes back to when they're small and when they're at the fish store, they're just a little washed out. And I can tell you after having mine for a couple of years, I mean, they're just bold, just really bold colored. Yeah. Yeah, so swap out the Tomini for a uh, yellow eye coal. That's what I've got going on. And again, I guess those are now... Unobtainium. Yeah. <laughs> but that was always just a great fish where, you know, it was affordable um, and a healthy one is mm -hmm. gorgeous. I mean, just people i think underappreciate that fish um it's funny because objectively when you're looking at a tomini and a yellow eye coal tang especially a good picture of one the coal tang is a in my mind objectively way more attractive than the tomini but they do nothing for me <laughs> no they don't do anything for it. they don't move me inside i have like five or six no seven i think it's seven different tominis throughout the tanks and i don't, I don't know maybe it's um there's definitely maybe like that sentimentality factor um, where, I don't know, the, 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 the white tail and the orange margins of the Tommy Tang, it's just, that's, that's my jam. Well, um, and I, I, I recognize this argument is a bit lost against the Tommy, but um, a yellow eye coal, obviously the yellow eyes, I, I, I like that personally, uh, but um, the dorsal fin will get very light orangey, at least the ones I've kept when they get big, you know, when they start to become more adult. And it's just a cool, subtle, like flame type of mm -hmm. dorsal fin that uh, I don't know. You don't s you don't ever see that depicted in the pictures of them, but it's always something cool that I appreciate in person. So yeah, I mean, I would say that it, all the tangs that you've never heard of, if you see them in a store, uh, they are probably going to develop into much nicer adult fish. You know, obviously, you kind of want to discourage most people from messing around with naso tangs and um a lot of different acanthurus like the, the general surgeon fish because they're just they're just gonna get so big i mean you i'm sure everybody here has seen oh, eight ten inch naso tangs in 125s doesn't make it right yeah it, but that's a personal preference i'm not gonna throw shade on anybody who is doing that i yeah i'm not I, I don't want to be part of the tank police, as they call it, but um, I don't think a tank looks good when the mm. fish are oversized, right? It's like the Oscar so in the 20-gallon tank kind of thing. Like, you're so not true, selling yeah. me on a on a cool glass box of a reef when there's this giant fish just pacing around in it. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, and... I recognize that yellow tangs and some of these ones we've even talked about turn into dinner plates in the wild, but I just, in my experience, they either it takes them a very long time to get there or, um, you know, you can, they, they I'm, I'm not going to say they grow to the size of the tank. That's not true, but they, they seem to hang in there in a size range that doesn't make you feel like they're out of place. Um, yeah. So the black tang is 15 years old, right? He's yeah. 10 inches. So you're talking for most zebra summers, maybe, you know, just less generalized, like half an inch a year, a little more when they're younger, a little bit less when they're older. Um, but, um, all right. So we talked, I think we, <laughs> I think we talked yeah. about surgeon fish enough. What are some other fish that you think are like totally underrated? Hmm. Let me see here. What did I write down? Oh, this one's a, this one's easy. It's, uh, I, you might think it's a cop out, but I truly believe that that fish is underappreciated. The flame hawk, the hawk fish. I think they are appreciated though. I don't know. I, I see them in a lot of tanks. I see. I don't. That's the, fun. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I see them I for the sale a lot. Get, so get, get maybe, some, get some love. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just, um, you know, I, a lot of times it's like you have to pick between a fish with a great personality and a fish that's 
pretty or like have has a lot of color yeah and they're they're one of those odd ones where you get both right you get it's it's a beautiful color it's not um it's not a lot of uh truly red fish to choose from in a sense that won't pick your corals true yeah red, red um, flame angel will pick on stuff uh tomato clownfish and some of those red clownfish will just be straight but you know bullies well and they're all like shades of red right like i have a flame angel but it's more orange than red okay and yeah, you know what i mean like, like a flame totally hawk right. is red right and they're just hilarious to watch you know i mean they're they're it's really fun when you have some large corals and they perch up high and they just dive bomb stuff like they really yeah. copy the behaviors of an actual hawk in the way they just dive bomb stuff yeah yeah so i mean maybe you're right maybe not underappreciated but uh it's uh I, and I get they're a bit of a risk with shrimp and all that fun stuff, but to me they're worth it. Like they're one of those fish that I want in every tank I have. <laughs> okay, well, uh, uh, one hawk fish that I think doesn't get enough love is um, the Caribbean uh, orange spotted hawk. Ooh, you know it's one of those things again. If you, they're the cheapest. They they have to be the cheapest. They're nano hawk fish. Their mouth is so small they could never even bother like a peppermint shrimp. And they have just these bright orange speckling on their face, and they're c very different from all the others. That's always been my go-to hawkfish. But um, speaking of the on the redfish, man, w one of my top tens that's really easy to throw out there is uh, firefish. Oh yeah, yeah. Firefish. I love me some firefish. The only thing I would say about the firefish is I try to do some groups of them. I put six in a forty gallon. Six in a, you know, my five foot Red Sea Reefer, ended up with two in each one. They they literally selected themselves into a pair. And when I've been diving, I've I've seen maybe up to four, but it's usually two or three in a burrow. So it's like, you'd think that would be kind of a gregarious fish, but no, no, absolutely not. Like, unless you have a really big tank and they can set up different territories, but regular firefish, purple firefish. And then if you're really paying attention, the bigger, slightly yellower purple firefish were described as a new species last decade, uh, Nema teleotris exquisita. And, you know, this, this, is, this is kind of gives it into the uh, semantics a little bit, but I picked up a pair of those recently. And I still remember, man, when you and I were just like, when, when Helfrich's firefish mm. were unheard of. And then I think it was sea-dwelling creatures that really kind of, uh, worked their way into like the Christmas Island, Central Pacific, and you got one. Do you remember that? I got a pair. You got a pair. And oh I was a little gosh. skeptical of like, are they really a pair? You know, because it was right. um, it was pricey to get to. But uh, how much but was it back then? Do you remember? They were a hundred and thirty each. I think. And that was a deal, right? Yeah. Yeah. There was and that, definitely that, a point you know, where they were count like for inflation, right? That was a while back. So, um, and I. It was funny because uh, I was really skeptical that they were a pair. I'm like, ah, I'm going to watch one kill the other one off, and that's going to be an expensive experience. But then my wife was with me. She was like, you can't separate them. <laughs> I was like, I remember okay. that story about Nicole. Yeah, that's really cool. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, dude, uh, uh, you know, 15 to $20 firefish is just so freaking beautiful. So much color, and they're out, and they don't mess with anything, and they're super hardy. And... I wouldn't say that they're totally underrated, but they should be celebrated, like just so much more. And then right along with them, um, all the other dartfish, right? You know, scissor tail goby and a zebra goby. Oh, my Lord. The, again, just like everything else, when they're small and just, you know, a little juvenile, they look cool. But when they get large and really settled in, they just glow, yeah. absolutely glow. I'll throw another one your way. It's not actually a... I wouldn't call it a cheap fish. Uh, I, I guess cheap relative to its more more well-known counterpart, but the Swalesi Basslet. Bro, I have it down here. I have it on my list. I literally, <laughs> I'm literally, sure it's blown out, but like, listen, I have a candy basslet yeah. and I have a Swiss guard and I've had Swalesi's before. Uh, this is something I'm gonna say about freaking every fish. It's muted at the fish store, and then mm -hmm. you get it home, and you get it conditioned. 
the all the orange just starts glowing. Yeah. It really comes out. So why do you have Swalezi down? That's so funny. I didn't write down that many fish, but my Swalezi is right, literally on here. Well, I mean, I, I, the um, you know the the candy basslet is out of my price range, right? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it's not like I bought the Swalezi as a poor man's. So the first one I ever got um, was I believe it was Macna in Atlanta, and uh, Kevin Cohen Live Aquaria was there, and uh, they didn't want to bring all their fish that they had on this display back to Macna. Mm -hmm. So me being a local resident, he was like, hey, do you want a couple of these fish? And he was really generous, and he gave me a Swalesi basslet and a yellow Tonga. Um, why am I drawing a blank right now? Um, Blenny? Blenny, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, and like you said, the Swalesi was all right looking, but once he got settled in my tank, the orange on that thing was crazy. And then... Again, I I get a kick out of having cryptic fish that maybe you don't see them every day, you know, but when you're chilling in front of your reef with a beer and that one time a week the dude pops out and looks at you and goes back in his hole, you're like, oh, hey, you know, <laughs> that that that's fun, right? The guy, the fish that are in your face begging for food all the time, nothing wrong with that, but it's cool to have some little surprises coming out of your rock work. Uh, mandarins are a lot like that too, where sometimes... At least in my experience, like mandarins will, I won't see them every day, but they're around, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But um, you must have a lot of rock. Uh, I wouldn't say so. Uh, I mean, I, I definitely don't have the rock wall ever. But mm. yeah, it's just that was a cool fish where you not only was it cryptic and cool in that regard, very durable. I mean, the thing was indestructible, and then it had a ton of color. I mean, like it's a win-win. So. You know what? Uh, I think my philosophy for fish and corals, but also, but you know, really the fish is. Um, there was a quote by Takashi Yamano in one of his first books, and I'm butchering it, but it, it, he was saying that something to the effect of, any fish in the peak of health is perfect. Yeah, and I really feel that way about so many fish. You know, there's certain certain species like that's just never going to do it for me. But on, on the flip side, just about any of these fish, you get it conditioned, you get it, you know, fed properly, you know, make sure it's not getting bullied. And there's something about all animals, all living things where it glows, you know, even like like humans, it, it, you know, when they're in their early 20s, males and females are just glowing. They're just kind of that uh, that fitness that you that you can see. And then you, know, you and I are kind of past our prime, so that's why we're putting <laughs> this in the podcast. <laughs> why are you depressing me? No, I'm just kidding. Um, but, yeah, so I, I really feel that way about a lot of fish. Um, I'm also a big fan of damselfish. Oh, yeah. I know they get really demonized and... But I, I mess mostly with the uh, Chrysiptera yep. and the Pomacentris. Um, and I tried to add them last, you know. Um, but, man, I don't know why people aren't just don't lose their mind when they see a metallic blue damselfish with yellow fins or yellow trim, either whether it's a stark eye or an azure or a Tasmanian. Um, those things are so awesome, man. They really get a bad rap. Yeah, I mean, uh, I've always liked the Starkey. That was always, I referred to as my poor man's resplendent angel. Um, but, I mean, even in my current tank, I have uh, an Azure Damsel. Um, I had three, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, I lost two, I, and I still don't know why. But uh, the, the other one's just holding out, you know, and he, it's kind of fun because he's darting in and out of the corals, very similar to, like, what I would see in a documentary or something. And like you mm -hmm. said how cheap is that fish versus how colorful it is, right? And it's easy to keep. Yeah, totally. I, uh, I recently got a group of eight small Springer's damselfish. And then I put them in my soft coral tank, which is now really mixed. And they're just like in and out of the branches. And they're still really small, you know? So they still have a lot of that blue, but they're in and out of the milk of stylo. They're in and out of the Kenya tree. They're in and out of... Um, I got an orange branching samacora, and it's just, they're so freaking cool, man. And, I mean, it was like 50 bucks for eight of them. Yeah. <laughs> I've been uh, tempted. To, I've never kept them, to be honest, the uh, Talbot damsels. Mm -hmm. I wonder, mm -hmm. 
you know, how they, how they look when they're healthy. And I, I can't find any good examples of anybody that's kept them, I guess, long-term and posted pictures about it. But I always thought those were pretty cool. Talbots are pretty cool, um, but really underrated. And I know this is one of Sanjay's favorite fish is the Roland die damsel oh, fish. Yeah. But unfortunately, there's like there's two forms, and one of them doesn't have that really white, light colored head that this gives them that funky pop. And it's like, all right, they're a little feisty, but they don't move far outside of a small territory. They don't have the tools to do a lot of damage. So, um, the Roland Eye Damselfish is one. I, last time I ordered some, they sent me the the wrong kind. With you know, they were just mostly gray. I'm like, what the hell, man? Get this out of my face. <laughs> I ended up giving those away. Um, but yeah, the, the Roland Eye Damselfish, um, all right, sorry, the Talbots, that's what you were saying. Yeah. Um, that's another one. Um, it's going to look okay at the store. You get it, you know, locked into your tank, it'll just glow. Yeah. It'll just be nice pinky yellow with some blue markings. Very awesome fish. Um, sorry, another those. group, man, that really has fallen out, I think, is uh, the Dottie Backs. Oh, yeah. Uh, when we were coming up, man, it was all about looking at Red Sea, uh, Sunrise, uh, Orchid, Dottie Back, and especially the Sailfin. And they're captain bred, but they're just they're just mass-producing them. And instead of, like, perfecting the quality, they're just increasing the quantity. And, man, I don't think anybody listening, almost no one listening, has seen, like, a perfect... Mananictus splendens, you know, the sailfin dotty back. Oh my lord. When you're diving, man, those things are freaking everywhere. Yeah. Just totally everywhere. Have you kept any uh dotty backs in your I career? I have an orchid dotty back in my tank. That's an always a uh whenever I set up a tank, I've got like a staple list of fish mm. that I just keep, right? Yep. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm right there with you. Hawkfish, um, yep, orchid dotty back, you know, it's purple, it's cool, it's not as cryptic, but it does bouncing around, you know, out of the rocks. Gives you something a little different than, you know, your tangs that are in your face begging for food. Um, I've always wanted to do a, um, uh, a neon dotty back, but I keep getting mm. mixed signals on those. Like some people actually, they do all right in a big reef uh, where they have enough space. And then other people report that they turn into absolute terrors. I don't know. Obviously, the captive bred ones are a lot more docile. Yeah. Um, yeah, the neon, neon and the Arabian, and then the uh, hybrid of the two, I've kept them all, especially the, you know, the Sankey Eye Donnie back. Right? These, they're not, they, they really are never going to go after any fish that's not its shape. You know, unless you have like a strawberry pictochromus in a 10 gallon tank, yeah. um, you should totally be able to get away. And the captive bread ones are small, so they can just, they'll kind of grow into their pecking order. I feel like a lot of the bad raps that sometimes some of these territorial smaller fish get are because they're viewed as nano fish and you put mm. them in a nano tank and, you know, the That's other fish point. are always in their business, right? So uh, I've always been kind of curious about that. Um, yeah, I don't know. I that That's another fish I would love to keep. Um, is it the Ilongatus or no, Ila... Elon got us. Yeah, you got it. You got yeah, it. those are those are cool, and they, uh, from what I've heard, they're mild mannered. Mm. You know, what other fish can you get that is ten dollars and solid pink and bulletproof? Now I'm talking bicolor diadema or strawberry dotty backs. Um, it's funny talking about these. These are like I have lots of surgeon fish. I got enough damselfish, but I don't have nearly enough dotty backs. But now that the fish populations are a little bit more fleshed out. It's like, oh, okay, well, let me look out for these things. But the one that's always been super top of my list is the, the captive bred orchid dotty backs. They do a really good job, but there is some electric quality of the wild ones that mm -hmm. do not reproduce in the captive bred ones. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah, because, I, I mean, I remember the wild ones, and uh, a lot of the elong. Uh, sorry, the, a lot of the captive bred ones, I feel like they almost come in a little ratty looking. Um, and the captive bred? Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and you know, one is I think they're small when they come in too, mm -hmm. right? Like they're they're going to sell them when they're 
as soon as they're at a sizable sale, they're and off they've been to the duking fish it stores. out in, in a vat with a thousand. Yeah, others. yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, they tend to they tend to grow up and and still look good, but I, I would I would imagine sort of like again, you're, you're you brought up freshwater fish. There's definitely um, in a lot of the freshwater species, you can tell the difference between a wild version and like one that's been captive bred many generations. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there's still that demand for a little bit of the wild stock, right? Um, mm-hmm. That's, I would say the Dottie back kind of a good example of that difference. But is it worth it to go and collect a buttload of them in the wild? No. I mean, like a captive bred orca Dottie back is beautiful, you know? Yeah, but uh, for me, I guess, I guess, you know, I bonded with the appearance of a wild one. But in general, like, I think you you made a really excellent point of like when they're freshly kept the bread, they've been duking it out. They're small. They're not mature. And I think what, what I'd like to get across with a lot of these fish is give them a chance. Yeah. <laughs> give them a chance. Um, any other fish that come to mind before we uh, turn mm. a page to a different broad uh group i'm not a super huge ras guy i'm always going to stick with like six line four line mystery ras a couple odds and ends and so i'm just i'm not the guy to talk to about rasses and everyone loves angelfish so i don't think they need any more airtime yeah i I actually love rasses but i am not willing to put a lid or a Mm. canopy on my tank so i've gotten away with you know a mystery ras uh at one point in my life um and I may try one of those again with this new tank with the the slightly larger rim, but you know I'm not going to get into the fairy or flasher rasses just because um, I'll always have an open top tank. And I need to get into some, some flashers because I've I've never personally kept them. And rasses are a fish I've very much enjoyed seeing in other people's tanks, but man, even like the cheapest Macoskeri flasher ras, you see them actually flashing like their namesake. Oh, yeah. Oh my lord, it's it's a sight to behold, and I've never personally kept them. So, right now on this podcast, I am committing to getting a small <laughs> group of flasher asses. Um, let's see, I do have a pair of lineatus asses. I no, sorry, oh, not nice. a pair. I got two females, so that one could grow into a male, and I could just have them longer. Um, I always loved me some flame asses, but again, these are not underrated fish. They're I yeah. mean, everybody loves uh, all kinds of flasher asses, but one that's actually maybe not celebrated enough is the majority of the exquisite fairy races um, that are coming in mostly from Africa um, because they're really cheap and really common from there. Oh man, I've had one for, I got it for like 50 bucks and it's just all the patterns and all the colors that you see in the pictures. And as he's gotten older and more mature, um, he's just, he's yeah, he's really starting to turn on. I would say the exquisites like the races that, used to be unavailable but now are ubiquitous you know and i feel like that's the that is a trend for almost all of of aquarium livestock isn't it yeah like you were saying yellows versus gems yeah it's uh if it's hard to get then you know you want it more but um we're we're, i mean we're we're talking about the, the the creatures that have inherent value (laughs) <laughs> yeah not not whatever is the the it fish moment um i, I would say um, i'm trying to think if there's any other underrated fish i mean an easy one would be uh royal grandmas but oh um, god I, why do i not have that on my list <laughs> yeah Sorry, i'm almost clipped us right now <laughs> dude i am yeah i'm just i'm just waiting for the right time for my my quarantine system to just be you know vacated yeah. And I'm going to get 20 Royal Grandmas. I mean, I would get a bunch of Dijongs too, but uh, Black Caps also. But yeah, Royal Grandma, there's something about that fish. I, I guess they're probably like 15 or 20 bucks now, but growing up, they're like 8 to 10 to 12. And just, I want them small. I want to grow them out. I mean, I super appreciate the um, the one from the Cayman Islands that are never collected for the hobby. They're like a third purple and two thirds yellow. You nailed it on the head with Royal Grandmas. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's. I mean, again, maybe sort of like uh, flame hawks. You do see them in a lot of tanks, 
but uh, I definitely feel like people take that fish for granted. Um, it's almost like a like a token fish they throw in versus like mm. something that they're like, oh, I'm gonna build my nano tank around this, you know, fish. Like, something you could say about man, just about every, uh, almost all fish species is like if you again if you give it the perfect conditions mm -hmm. so that it can be the boldest fish whether it's a firefish or the swalazy or even a basic scopus tang um, but especially a, a cheap royal grandma oh my lord it is gonna shine but it's not gonna sh you know in these days it's not gonna shine as much in a blue heavy reef tank is it yeah you need that daylight color to really bring out the yellow, to really bring out the magenta purple. I, I, I kind of wish we'd ha we had already had uh, domesticated grandmas. Well, and you, the, I, like what you, I like what you said about the lights because I feel that way about how coral, coral selection has shifted too, right? Um, certain types of corals, especially like blue corals, you don't see as much demand for, I imagine, because of the way the lighting spectrum has gone so well let's put a pin in the corals sure i think yeah, yeah i mean i just want to say i'm going to say this again and again with the garden the fish and the corals you get it in the peak of health you're going to have a fun fish right um so so give an extra chance um to some fish that you may not have heard of or maybe some fish you see all the time and can't understand why they're popular um and uh i know we're gonna have a long long rabbit hole when we get to the corals so maybe we can just touch on some invertebrates Ooh, uh i think one of the most underappreciated inverts would be the uh um pin cushion or you know that whole kind of smaller set of sea urchins whether they're tuxedos whether they're tuxedo urchin yeah. bro that's number two <laughs> on my list so they're so fun. I mean, they're just, they graze, they, they do a complementary grazing job to what three different mouths of certain fish will do. They're actually beautiful, you know, the blue ones. And it might be a little bit of, 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 of annoyance when they pick stuff up and move it around, but actually it's mostly fun. Yeah. Right? Do you have any tuxedos right now? Yeah, and then I've just got your typical, you know, Atlantic, pin cushion white urchin and uh it's funny when they meet up because when i have a picture of when the tuxedo and the uh pin cushion like intercepted each other and they're mm -hmm. both wearing corals as hats you know <laughs> 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 and uh i took a picture because i'm like i wonder what those two are talking about but uh <laughs> <laughs> you know um yeah i mean i, I saw some guy is 3d printing hats that you can oh throw in the tank goodness. uh and you know like you're urchin picks up a witch's hat or a top hat and <laughs> i had uh oh, i still have it a, a, a tuxedo who wore a cap of green star polyps for over a year bro the green star <laughs> polyps kind of grew under itself and it was just so much fun because with the tuxedos and, and your picking cushions you never know what they're going to pick up sometimes they're going to find little pieces of corals and stuff like you didn't even know you had you know that broke off in the back um but it was really fun seeing the tuxedo urchin carrying around a green star polyp mat but i had to take it off because the tuxedo urchin would you know he'd crawl cruise all over the tank and there was this one spot where he was brushing up against i don't remember exactly which coral but he was stinging other corals <laughs> by carrying this hat of green star polyp but that's just so funny that you you and i both had the swalazy and the tuxedo uh on our list yeah that's well and that's it's, a, it's a good example of um I, this is sort of what i was hinting in one of our last conversations of as soon as somebody hears a negative attribute about something it's like they throw the baby out with the bathwater, right so mm. you talk so about true. damselfish right so then all so of a true. sudden Chrysiptera, which are this little, you know, species of damsel that don't really deserve the reputation of like, you know, the Daskalis or the Poma centris, center, mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're their own thing and they're cool as hell and they're laid back, you know, and you can keep them. Uh, Dottie Back's got a bad rap, right? Um, and then I remember everybody like 10 years ago were like, oh, don't put urchins in your tank because they'll grind away at all your coralline algae. 
I wish. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> I stopped. I, I, I hold back dosing iodine on because I felt like that was the limiting factor to coralline growth. And I, I really see coralline algae as a competitor with my corals. Like, okay, and there I have a different tank where they're, they're not, I don't have fast growing corals. But um, yeah, now I wish I could find more urchins to actually grind down coralline. Well, and the hitchhiker thing, right? It, it's really not the end of the world, right? Like, ah, oh, they're no. moving my frags around, and uh, it's same with it's like it's more uh, fun. Yeah, <laughs> uh, Mexican turbo snails, right? Oh, I don't keep them; they knock everything over because they're. I'm like, yeah, but they're great. I mean, they'll mow down things other snails won't, right? So, as as I said in a previous episode, like I'm not a snail guy. Yeah, the only snails I have are of those that hitchhiked on colonies that I bought or if they're small enough you know on frags I have I have probably not bought any non-decorative snail snails in 10 years yeah. I do like my trochuses though um, but kind of the same vein I just want to touch upon my stomatellas again I'm going to bring those <laughs> up as often as I can but like you're going to start a trend, man. Somebody out there is captive well, breeding them. you can't sell them, them so that you can't trend them, yeah. right? You can't come up with funky names for them. They don't have any crazy colors. They just exist. But, um, like, you, that, dude, a tuxedo urchin is worth, what, 20, 30, 50 hermit crabs? Yeah. <laughs> it's not even close. It's like it's not even in the same league. Yeah. Um, but stomatellas are awesome. They don't get any airtime. Like, people will talk about their you know, top 10 cleanup crews. And I'm like, that's the guy. That's the one. But you know what I do buy? Abalones. Oh, really? Yeah, dude. I have a big abalone in each of my coral flats. You know, during the day, they'll, they'll kind of park somewhere and just kind of hang out. And as soon as it starts getting dim, I mean, you can see them hitting the spots that are the heaviest. I don't have filamentous algae or any, anymore. I yeah. Mean, but they, they really grind down that biofilm that consists of, you know, algae, bacteria, coralline. Um, yeah, I mean, and they're all cultured. I'm pretty sure you can't get wild abalones. If they eventually die, then, you know, you end up with a beautiful shell. <laughs> um, but yeah, I've just always loved an abalone. It's just, you know, a stomatella that's a hundred times <laughs> bigger. <laughs> yeah. I've never kept one, uh, to be honest. Yeah, they're, they're, I, they're so neat. They are so, see, see, underrated livestock. Like you've never kept it. Well, yeah. it's because I'm usually ordering them from a wholesale list yeah. or special ordering them. And you primarily are encountering normal stuff at the local aquarium store, right? Right. And yeah. you just haven't seen that one. Just ask for them. They're, since they're cultured, they're like super stable supply. Should be like 20 bucks, 25 bucks. I'm going to have to try that. I've, yeah, had, I've had the uh, hitchhiker chitons, you know, but I don't, mm. I, I don't know what they do. They're just cool to see because, you know, it's like a little prehistoric animal chilling out in your reef tank. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, I have, I, you know, I think the most underrated cleanup crew is everything that you pretty much can't buy. Yeah. Right? Stomatellas. I got little limpets everywhere. I got small chitons. Um, and for those of you that don't know, um, a, a limpet is kind of like a cone shelled snail, so that it doesn't I've got spiral. Those, yeah. And then a chitin, it, it looks so bizarre. I've got, um, I mean, I've got it through all my tanks, but it's a small one. It's probably like a quarter inch, you know, six millimeters or so, all different colors. But in the past, I've had some grow to like up to two inches. And, and you, can't, you can't really buy those so much. Yeah. Like they just have to hitchhike along to end up in your aquarium. Um, but yeah, chitons are pretty cool. Yeah, you he stumped me on the inverts. I'm, I couldn't really think it of. We'll, we'll keep it. We'll keep it a little bit shorter. But all you right. know what is the most underrated invertebrate of all? Bristle worms. Oh yeah. You don't have to love them. But they've been demonized lately again, man. Uh, you go on the uh, forums. Again. And, <laughs> well, I guess. There was a little period there where, you know, everybody with their deep sand beds were like, oh, you know, don't add these starfish. They're going to eat all your bristle worms and destroy your your uh, sand bed, you know, where I think since deep sand beds aren't really a thing anymore, um, except for maybe some, some holdouts out there. Um, I, I think people now are not digging the bristle worms anymore. 
when I started the aquarium hobby, definitely it was like, oh my god, bristle worms! You got to get traps. You got to get a an arrow crab to eat them. Yeah. You have to get an arrow crab to eat them, right? Like we get peppermint shrimp to uh, eat Aptasia, and you had to get an arrow crab to eat your your bristle worms. But now when I when I when people tell me or ask me about the bristle worms in their tank, I'm like, if you have bristle worms, it's because they're eating un- uneaten food. They're eating yeah. leftover food. If you take those guys out, what do you end up with? Rotting food. Well, and the people that post and they have, you know, I've seen some pictures online where they feed the tank and hundreds and hundreds of bristle worms come out and it looks like something out of a horror movie. Mm-hmm. And everybody's, you know, demonizing the bristle worms. And I'm like, dude, what how much food are you putting in that tank? Because their population will swell and wane based on your feeding habits, right? I mean, only, yeah. only based on your leftover food. Right. So you have a free cleanup animal. Yeah. And you want to dog it? Like, it's like a it's like an elastic cleanup crew that scales up when you're <laughs> feeding too much. You know, I, again, you can't buy bristle worms. You can't buy stomatellas. You can't buy limpets and little chitons. And you know what else you can't buy and is also demonized? Hmm. Asterinas. Oh, I got a crap ton of those, man. I have four different species. There's one with kind of red in the center. There's one with kind of bluish dots towards the center. And there's one that's kind of like the typical gray. Typical gray. And I'll be honest, I had this, I don't know what, I don't know what was going on. Entire tank, totally fine. One nice slow burn mandapora, they just somehow they, the, the coral was telling them, come eat me. But they, they only graze the edges a little bit. And I don't, there's a part of me is like, oh, I wonder if they're actually preventing this thing from receding all the way by eating the edge. But this is like one out of a thousand corals. I actually, I do not spread Asterinas on purpose. But I want everybody to be, you know, keenly aware that just like bristle worms, and they're, you know, obviously they're cooler than bristle worms. Um, there are multiple different species. One of these days, I'm gonna do a video just going through the studio. I'm gonna go on safari, just find all the stuff we were talking about. But there's no commercial interest in sussing out the value of Asterina starfish if you can't sell them. <laughs> well, that's just the state of the, you know, the the, the hobby. It's kind of a bummer. You're, you're spot on about the, I think, misinterpretation, too, because um, I think when you see the Asterinas there, they're probably cleaning up something that's already going on, almost mm-hmm. kind of like maggots on dead meat. I know that's a gross yep. analogy, but um, a good example is, you know, I, I hate, you know, it's embarrassing to admit, but we talked about my uh, dosing container being empty and me not realizing it, right, mm-hmm. uh, in one of the other podcasts, and the uh, my alkalinity dropped from like eight to four, right? I don't test my alk. I don't have a trident. But when I noticed it was empty, I was like, I should probably test my alk so I know how much I should incrementally, slowly keep adding to kind of get back to where I'm at, right? Because if I just refilled it and the dosing pump continued at the level it was dosing, I, I, I had catch up, right? I had to be, right. I had to catch up on my alkalinity a bit. So, so I needed to do that calculation. Well, with my ALK at four, the only acropora I have in my tank is a Jason Fox Flame Acro, or whatever the pink with the yellow oh, Fox tips. Flame. Fox yeah. Flame, there you go. It's the only acro I have in my tank. And uh, it receded from the base a bit. As soon mm. as my ALK was where it needed to be, the recession stopped, right? But you see this like dead tissue and the things I found chilling there were a limpet and Asterina snails, right? And if I was uh, a neophyte or, you know, maybe less experienced, I would have immediately jumped to the conclusion, you know, hey, you know, that that invertebrate is eating my coral, right? Mm. But it wasn't. Yep, it's absolutely. There's some dead mass there. There's some organic material, and they're just munching it up. You know, they're doing me a favor. I, You know, I, I don't want to unequivocally say that Asterinas are good for your tank, or, or, or will never harm your corals, but man, I have, it's, you know, it's also like the bristle worm thing too, right? Like if you just stop feeding like crazy, but you have all this coral, especially like shrooms and really juicy stuff, but all of a sudden you just kind of, you know, pull back on the feeding, Asterinas and bristle worms, I mean, that, they'll be a little bit more opportunistic, but man, I, I've, I've 
celebrated Astorinas and paid close attention to them for decades. And there's been like two or three moments when they were, you know, probably doing kind of the maggot thing. But if like, hey, if they're eating dead flesh before it can turn into a, a, a viral infection, they're probably helping out a lot. So, yeah, I think. Well, um, so I've got an get insane. A bad rap population of astorinas right in the morning i'm sure you've got the same thing in the morning before the lights come on they're all on your glass right uh and it, so my question is always like how can i have that many astorina snails in my tank and be growing coral right like why are they just not eating all my coral up right right so right. another one that i like is uh and I don't know what species it is, but because, um, you know, we've always stumbled upon little micro brittle stars here and there. Mm. But mm -hmm. there was a guy selling them by like the bags on a forum. And I'm like, how the hell is he? You how know, do you harvest those? How do you like, I, I know yeah. I have them. I have a lot of them. But I could find one here. I could find one there. Mostly in like my Ketomorpha bowl is my like might be like the most go-to place I could look for those those brittle stars. So the ones I got from the, I so I ordered some from this guy. I was like, all right, send me a bag. And I was curious, like, how the hell are you propagating or growing these things out, right? Those things, whatever he, whatever subspecies or whatever he had, they're crazy all over my tank. And when I feed my tank there's just little arms sticking out of mm. all my corals and rocks. They're everywhere. If I pick up a coral, there's like 20 of them underneath. So now I kind of get it. Like if, you know, if they were going like that buck crazy in his tank, he, I could easily like harvest them. And that got me thinking about when you and I were in inner zoo in Germany, there was a restaurant we went to, I think it was like a Chinese restaurant. Tangs. Huh? T yeah. It's called Tangs. And with all the giant tanks <laughs> and those tanks had these micro brittle stars with red stripes on them. They were like the little ones that, mm -hmm. and, uh, I, I was like, man, I wish I could grab some of these and go home. Cause I've never seen a colorful version of like a micro brittle star that's in your like substrate. Right. Uh, so if anybody out there has those, man, I want, I want some. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't want, I don't want to dog on the industry too much, but there's definitely a disconnect between some of these animals that are really great for your tank. Uh, stomatellas, limpets, chitons, asterinas, these little brittle stars, and their ability to be commercialized. Yeah. All right, so enough on that. Um, a couple more inverts I want to point out that probably don't get eno enough love as uh, porcelain crabs. Oh, yeah. Those Just are porcelain cool. crab and anemone, man. That is Heck yeah. like like the, uh, the, the clownfish anemone uh, symbiosis is not complete until you have a little porcelain crab, you know, just throw it up its little fan-shaped filter feeder claws. Oh, my God, those are so cool. That being said, I don't have any. <laughs> I've got a few anemones, but... Uh, yeah, I don't I don't have any porcelain crabs right now because I just I don't encounter them at the local fish store, and so I just have to go out of my way. But that used to be a lot more of a staple. And then I would say pretty much all ornamental shrimp. Hmm. All ornamental shrimp. Coral banded shrimp, cleaner shrimp, blue coral banded shrimp, gold coral banded shrimp, Zanzibar shrimp, go shrimp. <laughs> There's so many ornamental shrimp out there that just... They're only harvesting, you know, fire shrimp, cleaner shrimp, and like a few coral bandits. But and obviously, you know, the the, the aptasia eating uh, peppermint shrimp. Um, That's a good point. Uh, you you could really count on your fingers, like the the ornamental shrimp that you see for sale, uh, and you know that there's way more out there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, all right. I know people want us to get to the corals. We, we had to touch on the inverts. I love the clams. I don't think I can make a case for people to love a hip opus clam <laughs> because they're objectively just only pretty from like a top down angle. But I've seen them, you know, even diving it like, oh, okay. <laughs> it just doesn't compare <laughs> to everything else that's out there. All right. So now we can get into the corals. And I firmly believe that every coral is underrated. Do you know what I mean by that? I think I do. I think, uh, so I, I have a thought on that and it probably aligns exactly what, what you're thinking. Go ahead. Um, so when you were posing this question, I was trying to think of, okay, what's an underappreciated coral, but the problem is the ultra crazy color Instagram picture popped under blue light crowd. <laughs> 
they're in every coral now, right? It used to be like it was all about the SBS, but they and now LPS, softies, you know, you got thousand dollar mushrooms. So, um, so I, I guess my argument there is that the non limited edition ultra version of any of those coral species looks can be amazing. Again, sort of going back to what you said about fish. If you grow out any coral that's mm. decent, decent looking, right? Preach, preach. preach. It's going to be amazing, right? Uh, a pale green favia, like grown to the size of a softball, right? It's going to look awesome, right? Mm. It doesn't need to be orangey, glowy, with a limited edition name on top of it. So, I, I know that's a bit of a generalization. I mean, I could give you some specific examples of underappreciated corals that I think have fallen to the wayside maybe like from we'll the get, past we'll get to those. yeah but but you get my point yep um yeah I, just just like i said with the fish uh, just about every single coral when it's in the peak of health is just just a beautiful beautiful specimen and it doesn't i mean I'm sure there's a crowd who's only going to be into uh the corals that you know, burn their retinas with fluorescence and and crazy colors. But, you know, something we're going to say over and over and over on reef therapy is that the frags, you know, when they're small and they're just all you see is that, 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 that leading edge, you know, whether it's the encrusted part or the yeah. tips, of course, it's going to make for an amazing picture. Um, dude, man, almost every single one of those corals as they grow out, um, they just... They, it's really hard to dial it in perfectly. That's one. And two, even when you do, when they get larger, there's a lot of branch, not a lot of tips. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. This is especially true of the tenuous. You know, Walt Disney tenuous grown out is mostly yellow. Yep. You know, it makes for an amazing frag. But, um, you know, one coral on my list that's kind of the top of my list of underrated corals, I think would have to be uh, Christmas favia. Hmm. Yep. If, if you know you're listening or watching and you you don't know what that is, it's just a nice neon green favia with red mouths. You can pick this up anywhere, anytime, and it shouldn't be more than twenty or thirty bucks for a good size frag or even a mini colony. And to to be honest, like I have one. And I wasn't feeding my tank enough, and the the green got muted, the red got muted, and then I got my nutrients back up, you know, the, just a little bit of nitrate, a little bit of phosphate, and uh, regular feeding, and now it's just colored from edge to edge. And that's a coral that looks amazing under, you know, daylight spectrum and blue light. Yeah. And it's not I, too aggressive either. No, and uh, again, it's an example of one that if you keep it for like five years, it'll grow into a really nice colony mm -hmm. and it'll look amazing. I have yeah. one that same story. It got muted. It lost all its green. It's just red. Um, but it was shaded by a huge leather coral that I have. Um, and, uh, just recently I, you know, I removed, it had like grown off of a rock, but when they get big enough, they are their own rock, right? So yep, I took it out to my driveway and I chiseled it off the rock with a hammer. Mm -hmm. And then I put it out where there's more light and uh, now the green's coming back. And I'm like, man, I neglected that coral. You know, I felt felt bad, but it, it hung in there. And now the colors are coming back and you start to, again, appreciate like, oh, yeah, this is why I have this coral. It's an amazing coral. Yeah. No, Christmas Favia is definitely top of my list. And I think there's probably like... We're talking about actual favia, not misidentified favia. Yeah. There's a lot of, of green favias, um, red favias, pink favias, orange, um, especially from Western Australia, that um, it might be a little bit more challenging to keep some of those colors like really peaking. Uh, Aquapower really, really helps yeah. <laughs> across the board. Um, but, but yeah, almost every single group of coral, I think, is, is underrated. Yeah. Yeah, I actually had Favia on my list because uh, there's there's a lot of common strains of it. Uh, I had mm -hmm. a pale green one with no red, but um, 
man, when it's just healthy and kicking ass, it's just a beautiful coral, you know, especially when it starts to get that domed shape as, yep. you know, it matures and grows. I mean, it's, yeah, when you have a little frag on a square, you don't really see the full potential. Yeah. Um, uh, for me, the candy cane that you and I both have from back in the day. 20 years old, the star mint. Yeah, you know, it's it's cool. I mean, yes, it has a brown outer with white stripes and a green center, but I actually like it better than the neon glow and the dark green ones, right? It, it has yep. more... Um, more 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 to it it's not just this solid glowing color and that's a really cool coral i mean even all candy corals honestly um they're a high light coral they're a low light coral oh, they're yeah. lying on the bottom of your tank coral you've forgotten about it in the back of your aquascape coral man candy corals i didn't have that on my list but that's a great point like you also I feel like I haven't intentionally kept that coral, but it just has been in my tank forever because mm -hmm. exactly like you described, I'll hack it back sometimes and some piece falls in the back of the tank and starts into a new colony. So it's just, it, it's like the, it's like having somebody in your house that just won't leave. You know, <laughs> it's just, you want to hear something funny, man? Um, the starment really is special. Like, again, it's a brown candy coral with a green mouth and whitish green stripes very well defined a lot of people say they have it but i've seen colonies and pieces that fit that description but they don't hold a candle to the star mint i've l really actually looked for comparable strains for almost 20 years but um, i gave a piece to a local fish store and it just looks so good in his tank he is now selling them for about $75 per polyp. Good for him. And they sell out incredibly fast. How weird is that? Yeah, that's, like really a, that's like a local hype thing, but had nothing to do with Instagram. It has everything to do with people seeing it in his tank. In person. Yeah, seeing it in person. Yeah, candy corals just, I wish they had a little bit more range. But mm. uh, even, even uh, the teal one, uh, you know, I recently actually picked up a teal strain with a greener mouth. Hmm. So I only have one little frag of that. Um, but yeah, candy coral is the great for beginners, low light, high light. And, you know, I feel really strongly about in any aquascape, you need some supporting actors, mm -hmm. right? If everything is just burning your retinas, it just makes it really hard to focus makes it really hard to focus and that's i think that's what the soft corals are really good for i actually have a nice assortment of sinularias nephthias and sarcophytons and I, i've been shuffling them around I, a lot of these started off in the soft coral tank and they've moved over to kind of my i have a very intense uh, you know sps of coral flat and then I have a like a normal intense one but in the normal intense uh, coral flat um I just kind of gr started grouping them, and man, they just every single one of them just just super fuzzy and just super healthy, and w with a lot of light and a lot of flow, they don't get stringy. They get they get dense. Yeah, yeah. I was actually when you were talking, that's right where my brain went is, um, if you put you know your usual strain of oh these are great for low light tank soft corals and you give them a ton of flow and you give them a ton of light it's like a whole different animal you know yeah i mean they're amazing um that you know that that's a great point because it kind of harkens back to the damselfish they're treated like crap yeah you know they're not given good lighting they're not given great nutrition same thing with the soft corals when you treat them like a third-rate coral they're gonna look like a third-rate coral you know and you put them into ideal conditions and they're just they're really really catchy well you think about their morphology right they have the ability to beef up you know so if the current's really strong there's they're 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 like oh this is like a reef crest type condition they can change their morphology in a sense, like they can beef up their, their, their shape, you know? So uh, what, like, like take my leather corals, right? They've got like stems that are like wider than a beer can because they're, mm -hmm. they're having to put up with those gyres, you know? And right. it's just cool to see them like that. Right. Whereas when you see like leathers in like a, 
kind of a crappy flow area they're just they they, they keep perforating and dropping little babies like mm-hmm. they're trying to get the mm-hmm. hell out of there you know <laughs> they're like yeah. like maybe my offspring can find something better this sucks um but uh you put them in some good flow and it's a whole different story so let's uh let's take a little detour and just uh a little t- a trip down memory lane and talk about the original green polyp sarcophyton Oh, uh, that's a Colorado native. Well, not native. It's not from Colorado, but that that was one of those that was just passed around the uh, the Denver area, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, that that was an interesting one. Um, I remember moving to Atlanta, and it was like that coral, the green slimer, the orange cap. Like nobody in Atlanta had it. And I was like, mm-hmm. what are you talking about? Like, this is in, like, everybody's tank in Denver. It's like a wee. Like, you can't get rid of it. Yep. And then you came here, and people were like, whoa. <laughs> well, what's interesting is that um, I'm pretty sure that's where Tyree got it. Um, you know, it's that coral was here. It was grown by one of the first coral farmers ever. Do you remember his name? Mm. Is it Noel Curry? Oh scientific, yeah, yeah. Scientific, scientific corals, corals. Inc. out of Atlanta. Yeah, and I, I was I remember like when he was still in business. I, I tracked down the uh, the lineage, I guess, of this coral. Came from Tonga, and then it went to Scientific Corals Inc. He had little ads in Famas in the late '90s. He made a small resurgence, but didn't really make a, uh, a, a an impact, I guess. And then Steve Chang got a piece, and man, this is way before green polyp leathers of various types were ever brought in from oh, yeah there's nothing like australia. it out there mostly australia and i actually have a green polyp leather that i collected in australia and i have a couple other strains but man and when you become a soft coral connoisseur um that green polyp leather is still the brightest because yep. some of the others they have greenish polyp stalks and then like really green tentacles or vice versa, or only green tentacles, but that original 20 plus year old strain of gr- neon green polyp uh, sarcophyton is the, 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 the capitulum, the crown itself is, you know, nice doo doo brown, but then the polyps are neon green. And I feel like there's a, that one uh, iconic image from Chris Capp's tank when he was yeah. tank of the month, I think yep. 2005. Massive reggae, one. <laughs> well, at the time it was massive, but now they're, they're a lot bigger, but he had a, a lawnmower blenny just sitting in that field of neon green polyps. And this is before uh, blue LEDs really made those colors pop even more. Um, but yeah, that's that's a coral that deserves a lot of respect. It's so funny, man. Now every store in town, like you can find small, medium, large colonies for 20, 30, 50 bucks. There was a, you, w- sorry, go ahead. You know, you and I would just like, we were, we were pining for one back when there was a wait list and they were a hundred dollars. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Remember when you had to wait, like I'd be on the Tyree list for a coral and you'd have to wait like a year for for the month that you were gonna get mm-hmm. the frag, but then the frag really only was like a hundred bucks, and now it's like, I mean, I get inflation and all that, but now like a hundred bucks is like cheap, uh, not cheap, that's, that's but a, that's a normal nice coral. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's not one you wait a year to buy. Um, that it's well, yeah, okay, I'll, it's your turn, you know. But I so heard uh, a story about that coral repeatedly, and I have no way of proving the the truth of it or anything i'm sure you've heard the story too that it was like this strain was being propagated for cancer research in the denver area and i don't know i could never prove that that was true so i was always like ah okay like somebody confounded with some of garf's um claims that Uh, they were growing sarcophytons for research i don't i think back then they were mostly bioprospecting for pharmaceutical and pharmacological compounds. Um, But now I know that that is a thing. Yeah, it was just- I don't know how deep they're going into it. They were, the the, the story was like, that's why it was so, why it kind of bubbled up in the Colorado area. Um, And I was like, well, no, no, it was scientific corals and then they got a piece of Steve Chang and, but yeah, now there's there's a, I'd like to take some credit some, not all of it, for people 
really digging in into the sarcophytons, the irregular toadstools. Everybody's trying to rediscover the weeping willow leather coral, which is funny. It's so funny to me because, you know, I had that for so long. And then finally, I mean, I waited like 12, 13, 15 years to really like brag about it. And now everybody's got a weeping willow. I mean, we, we talked about that on the previous session. Yeah. Um, but, but it's, it's cool. It's, it's cool, cool that people are excited about a coral, not because it glows in the dark, you know. Yes. It's because it's it's yes. got a, a cool growth, a cool, you know, crazy polyp extension. And, you know, but color-wise, it's, you know, it's not like this, hi, you know, highlighter color coral. So, uh, you know, it's, it's nice to see that. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then, uh, you know, just uh, when I talk about soft corals, um, moving on, not quite a soft coral is, you kind of started touching upon that, um, is regular shrooms. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is. I don't know if my, even my dimmest corners of my coral tanks, I don't have many shrooms. I did get my hands on some classic purple rhodactus probably in December. You know what I'm talking about? The mm -hmm. purple Tonga purple bullseye, even though it's not from Tonga. Oh my Lord. But that is a coral that looks almost black under blue lighting. Back to what you were saying about the blue corals. The blue corals under blue lighting do nothing. Yeah, but blue uh, actinodiscus mushrooms are yes. amazing in daylight spectrum. I've got them all over my tank and I need to get some from you. <laughs> I mean, they just randomly float around and start setting up shop. And I've been very fortunate that they, they're they almost like, hey, we're going to cover any exposed rock, but they don't seem to irritate my corals much. Um, Save me some. I, need a, I think I'm going to have to set up just a whole new tank with the old school techniques with almost no filter <laughs> to because, and you know what? That's crazy. Chris Cap come in again. The last time I saw like nice patches of just classic watermelon discosoma reds and then the blues, he had a tank that was just packed with them, packed with them, just making like a little stairway to heaven, you know, from the bottom of the tank to the top. And that's a daylight coral, man. That's a, that's a daylight thing because if you, yeah, again, once again, if, you, if you're only going for the blue light, you're just not going to be able to appreciate and enjoy that coral. Uh, the way it's meant to be those are cool yeah i they're in my tank because i love them and i and i um going old school i guess i remember way back in the day jp burleson the mm -hmm. guy that used to bring in tunzi and um he, he also had these back on wet dries were cool he had like the Dupla. sweetest yeah um but he his tank uh i remember just was like a field of different shrooms and uh i think he had blues in there he had some other colors in there but i remember just being enamored with that tank and then in the midst of like his shroom you know just his his um field of shrooms he would have like little maxima clams popping out with the mm. electric blue mantles and it was just a cool tank um i think you and i are going to help bring back some of these old favorites you know if you guys want to fight over a half inch one inch neon orange jawbreaker shroom or a collectus that is gonna grow hyper slow you got you, you know you, you you have at it i'll let you guys duke it out me i'm just give me that regular old you know kind of orange red blue and watermelon shrooms of my youth mm -hmm. <laughs> the shrooms of my youth the regular classic discosomas it's you know what it's so funny too man because like Every coral has had its moment of hype, right? Yeah. And the Jawbreaker was probably the first one to kind of put the shrooms on the map. And then the bounces. And then they started finding all these other bounce varieties. I have never had a bounce. I've just really enjoyed them in other people's tanks. I currently have, I think it's a, um, a biohazard bounce that I am rehabilitating uh, for somebody. But I just, I can't. I, I would much rather have a field of regular discosomas that are colorful under daylight lighting than some of these super neon strains. And I'm very happy to have my purple bullseye shroom again. But um, in the last three to six months, they've been finding a lot more new varieties of Rhodactus. Uh, and you can get colonies now, thankfully, for, you know, 100 bucks, 200 bucks, maybe 300 bucks sometimes. 
um, that are um, uh, kind of rusty orange, either with like a, a colorful rim or a yeah. colorful mouth. Um, so it's cool. It's cool to see shrooms get their moment because you, you never would have thought that that would happen. I've struggled with the um, the copper colored ones. Um, kind of like the orangey red. Yeah, but almost with like metallic a metallic but, sheen to yes, them. Yes. I don't know. I've tried multiple times. I've got a frag of one now, and I thought it would be a really cool compliment you know um complimentary color with like the blue shrooms if they you know were duking it out but it just sits there and hangs in there and <laughs> uh, i don't know uh, i that goes back to your discussions about um in the past that we've had about knowing where the coral comes from and mm -hmm. and um you know for all i know right like daylight spectrum blasting them maybe they come from overhanging you know, oh, sorry, underhangs or something like maybe maybe I'm I'm just not giving it what it needs and it's miserable. Yeah. But. Um. Yeah. Yeah. We we I'd like to see shrooms come back the way they used to. Not all these crazy strains. I mean, don't get me wrong. Eclecticas are nice. Jawbreakers are cool. They're absolutely beautiful. But it's one. You know, if somebody has them, they have one, they have four or five. If they have a tank full of them, it's taken them years to get to that point. I'm like, okay, give me the regular discosomas. I'll enjoy them. Um, and uh, kind of back to some of the maligned, you know, kind of like the maligned fish that we were talking about or maligned inverts, Galaxia. Oh. Galaxy is such an awesome coral. I think the only person I know who has a real soft spot for him is Julian Sprung. He's got a nice big chunks of different species and strains here and there. But um, those sweepers, man. <laughs> they, they, uh, that's, that's one of those cases where it's almost like deserved. <laughs> it's almost <laughs> like a deserved bad rap because... I have them in with my euphilias. I have them near the overflow so the sweepers can go yeah, you know, kind of towards the drain. Yeah. But what's really funny is I have a torch spawn right next to them, and a torch spawn has its own sweepers reaching out towards the galaxia. And so if you're not familiar, if you're not current, um, and it makes a lot of sense in hindsight, galaxias are basically micro euphilias and micro fimbriphilias. And it makes a whole bunch of sense. And what's you know what's funny too, man? I don't have any green galaxia. I have gold galaxia. I have orange galaxia. I have green mouth yellow galaxia. I have regular ga yellow <laughs> galaxia. But I keep thinking I'm just kind of like have them in a holding pattern in the back of my euphilia tank. And Julian Julian noticed that when he was visiting the studio. I was like, ah, I see what you did there. It was really cool. I'm glad he he noticed that. But like, you know, a frag is is nice. But I remember, man, one time I was working at a shop and this guy brought us a chunk that was the size of a basketball. <laughs> and just watching the, the tentacles, like the waves of current pass over the tentacles, it's just, it's really a sight to behold. And I don't think you'd actually kill the Galaxia. Do you know the only way I've ever been able to kill the Galaxia? Hmm. With another Galaxia. <laughs> I had two Galaxias grown on the same magnetic thing, and one overgrew the other. There can be <laughs> only one. Yeah, it was, it was really funny. But, yeah, Galaxia is another one that I think, you know, in the future, people are going to find more strains and really start to discover and appreciate some of the nuances of that coral. Um, yeah, but... God, it's just like I want to make a better case for Galaxia, but those sweepers, man, like, again, it's one of those corals. You get it into peak condition, those sweepers have a very long reach, so you have to be very strategic about where you place that coral. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've kept it once long ago, and uh, I learned my lesson. <laughs> mm, mm. Um, yeah, they, they, oh my, they, they, they can burn through some corals before you realize, like, oh, <laughs> but if I ever find like a big used galaxy at a fish store, I, there's no way I'll be able to resist. I'm thinking I'll just I'll, I'll find uh, like a chamber or s one of my coral flats up. I'll find a corner for galaxies. They definitely deserve it. Um, would you got any other underrated corals in mind? Because I, I'm a can, I can keep going. Uh, I've got two easy ones uh, from the SBS realm, and um, I, but they've had their moment in the sun. But oh, I just. Okay. Um, 
I feel like you just can't ever go wrong with them if you're into the SPS thing. And obviously the green slimer, it, yes. it grows like bonkers. It's beautiful. I mean, you've got color, you got growth, you got hardiness. It's a staghorn, right? Um, and then uh, one of my all-time favorites uh, is the uh, orange digitata. Um, oh my goodness, you're talking my language. Yeah, I let's start, I, I let's got start over the, the Capricornus thing. That ain't my thing anymore. Um, but like a digitata, yeah, all day long. All right, let's talk about the Slimer a little bit. All right. You had a road tank of the month. Was that back in 2001? Something like that, yeah. Um, and you had, oh, we forgot one soft coral that's totally underrated. Um, you had a big old colony of green Slimer. Mm -hmm. Not six inches not 10 inches, but it was like 15 inches high. And just, you had, it was 65 K Iwasaki's. <laughs> so what did you do for flow on that tank? I think you had a Iwasaki return, but I don't know. I don't remember what the hell we used in the tanks anymore. And honestly, I just had, um, max jets galore. That's all, that's all we could do, huh? Yeah. That's yeah. And do. then, um, but no doubt once the Tunzi streams came out, uh, yeah. that was like an awakening for the green slimer, man. Like it was like a whole, whole different ball game with green slimers. Cause then, um, I mean, even uh, a few years ago in my 225, I, it was just insane how y you could literally, if you had like a, I don't know, a 24 by 24 cube, you could just put like one frag of green slimer in it, have a mm. ton of flow and just let it turn into a giant staghorn. And it, you wouldn't have to wait that long either <laughs> to do it. The only problem with that coral is that in order to really appreciate it, you need some scale. Mm -hmm. You're not really ever going to enjoy a six by six inch Slimer, Acropora young guy. You just, you really have to give it a lot of room. And I feel like that extends to, man, pretty much like all the, the true staghorns, right? Even like a blue tip brown, you get the, that coral. You remember you were visiting me at USC. Um, you get that coral, you know, super bright, like the brown almost fades away to like a light pastel yellow. Mm -hmm. um, but man, now you're really talking about very bright lights and, you know, daylight spectrum to achieve that. But those blue tips, oh my lordy. I don't, I don't, I don't have any regular blue tip stag. I have some other kind of varieties that are in that same neighborhood. Um, but one coral that's totally been forgotten is the uh, the Abrolo census. Oh, super yeah. Super fuzzy. I have a couple pieces that came from the right place, Abrolo Islands off the coast of Western Australia. Um, but they're not the old one that was like had that big, like chunky eraser tip that was like blue to pink and like super shaggy tentacles. I don't think I've seen that in a really long time. Yeah, that was another coral that looked phenomenal uh well for me at least under like 10 10k 14k lights where you know it had a little bit of a blue but you have some of that daylight in there mm -hmm. um that was that was a yeah that was a staghorn I, I guess you i mean i'm not really in the sps thing anymore but are, are there really a large variety of staghorns oh, uh, yeah. out there oh yeah yeah all right so you've got the green slimer yeah um, you got the blue tip green slimer. Okay. Or just, you know, blue tip young eyes, neon green, but with blue tips. Um, yesterday I just got back a piece of the Dallas, which oh, is Australia's yeah, analog. It's a hobby frag from Australian reefers that was analogous to the green slimer that kind of took over their tanks. Um, but the piece I got back uh, was grown, I think, in a combination of T5s and LEDs. And it's kind of got like little orange polyps at the base. But it's, it's, I don't know, it's a different shade of green. And it's got like some kind of dark notes um, on, the, on the flesh itself. Um, just super duper cool. Um, yeah, there's a, there's, a, there's a wide range of, of different staghorns. Yeah, um, the Steve Elias stag would be a really oh, good one. Oh, that was a good one. Yeah, I forgot yeah, about that guy. I need to get some of that back. Uh, that's all, that's all I'm interested in collecting nowadays. I mean, there's a few like oddball species, but I don't care about your funky named coral, as, as we said in the previous session. Um, I care about the corals that I used to have and the corals that I've seen in the wild. What about the? Um, uh, do do people still have love for the uh, Garf bonsai? Yes. Good. Yes, that is one of those corals that has really 
have the most staying power because it grows quickly, bright purple, green polyps. I had half a piece, but that was the only one that it got some kind of bugs on it. So I like clipped it off, threw it away, but there was a little bit that had encrusted on the rock. Now that's growing back and looking like it should. Nice. Yeah, yeah. that's... Oh, but going back to one coral that we forgot was the um, Fiji yellow leather. I've got that one. Yeah, is yours super yellow? No, it's not like the ones we saw back in the day. And I, I, I don't know if it's, um, is it a collection thing? Like where we used to get them versus where, you know, what we're getting today. Is it a change in lighting? Because I mean, even, lighting. you think it's lighting? lighting? Yeah. I got a piece from my catching corals. I even did a story on it, just kind of celebrating getting a piece back. It literally took like a year and a half to go from bright yellow to brown. Hmm. And I have since, um, I'm currently in the process of like getting it into more and more and more light. And it could be a blue thing, you know, it could be a blue light thing. So right now I have it in my highlight but bluish tank. And once it kind of settles into that i'll move into my high higher light higher flow and wider spectrum tank because oh man that that canary yellow just cannot be beat man and it's it's i would like it'll live like i actually have little bits here and there that there's nothing to point out nothing to point out but this one colony that I'm really looking after. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get it back. I'm gonna get back into that, you know, that just yellow tang, yellow coloration. There, yeah, there was a guy here in Atlanta, Richard. Uh, he, yeah. he had it under. He had it at the very. I mean, he had a wall of rock, right? Very but he top, had it in the top of the tank under Iwasaki's. Four hundred waters. Yeah, Iwasaki's, yeah. and man, it was like banana yellow. I mean, it was just crazy. Yeah. Can we have a, a, a moment of silence for Iwasaki's? They've been discontinued, bro. That's sad. I threw out my, uh, my remaining ones I had a few years ago just because I, I knew I'd never set up a halide probably again. Uh, it just, it's irresponsible now. It's irresponsible yeah. to use that much power. I hate to say it. I mean, maybe, like, I've always dreamed of, like, um, kind of rebuilding my old like my first reef tank was 75 gallon with four vho's and just you know kind of the same fish and corals but using 440 watts on a 75 gallon tank for just the lighting it just doesn't <laughs> seem like it just doesn't seem right anymore i God, thought about that once so to uh their tanks back in the day so much power like you know how people are into classic cars like get into mm -hmm. like classic reef keeping like set up a tank pull out my uh inland like aquatics dump bucket turf scrubber and mm -hmm. throw some halides on top and <laughs> see what happens um but no i i don't i don't have the the space for that i guess but uh you know it's kind of funny that in the early days i think you and i had more of an eye for these corals like i could pronounce echinophilia before they were dubbed chalice corals like i was looking for them i'd find big chunks that were just kind of off mauve colored and they would turn bright pink in my tanks and now you know the, the diversity has exploded but i think it's crazy like how every coral has had its moment so f yeah. almost every coral right like people are collecting encrusting lithophylons or specialty strains of leptoceris um I, I, you know i was grabbing that orangish flower anemone from the eight dollar bins that would turn neon orange in my tanks way before they had a moment. And now, you know, the shrooms, so like a lot of these corals, like they've really had their moment. I feel like Euphelia is almost like a perpetual moment <laughs> with the, the orange hammers and, and every variety of torch coral. And I'm sure down the road, like just, there's gonna be even more um, to play with. But, but one group that uh, still has not had its full moment would be, I think, Gorgonians. It's getting there though. I saw now. What is these glitter, uh, glitter something gorgonians? No, you're thinking glitter goniopora. What are you saying? Gorgonian. Oh, I misheard you. Gorgonians. Gorgoni yeah. Uh, well, let's let's touch on the goniopora's. I have I don't know maybe like fifteen or twenty different colonies of goniopora. At least half of them I bought as frags, totally expecting them to die. I have no idea what changed, what actually changed over the last 10 years 
that all of a sudden now I'm like looking at them like, hey, you're too big. <laughs> I need to frag you up. But that being said, dude, I have I have four different red gonies with yellow tentacles. Two of them look amazing. One of them looks amazing when the lights are blue, and the other one is you know, just kind of meh. And so that's a, that's one group. Like uh, even they're growing, and their polyps are out, and they're just super fleshy. But I prefer the ones with just more polyps in action. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. I don't like the. Um, I had a red one uh, for a long for time. A long time. I remember. Yeah, and it, it even popped off a little baby. Um, but then, um, unfortunately, you know, clownfish. Uh, I stopped keeping uh, an anemone in the tank, and hmm. they were like, "This will do." And so then I moved it down to my refugium for a while, and it did all right there. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. Eventually it, it, it wasted away. But I think that was because of my neglect because mm -hmm. the thing was pretty indestructible in my tank. But It's so funny how the first Ghani we could actually – reliably keep was the red gani yeah just regular red flower pot coral there used to be like and this thing about stay away from the green ones the red ones are okay right well it's it's deeper than that you know at the time i think the green ones were mostly gani apora stokes eye it's like mm -hmm. that regular you know a baseball sized piece that i don't know if people are actually keeping that species and then the red is you know kind of an, another species but it's yeah it's actually quite s remarkable when when we have frag shows that now that like a, a lot of coral vendors will have a section of frags it's hard to know how many of those are actually grown out versus just kind of chopped up yeah. um but uh yeah flower pots Never thought that they would have their moment in the spotlight. But I think Gorgonians, man, like, if you put a Gorgonian in a typical reef, it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's going to look all right. But I think you need that real wave action to really appreciate. And one coral that I really want to get into my <laughs> collection is just a regular old large polyp, Eunicea. You know, it's got those big fleshy brown polyps with, like, um, uh, pinules on the tentacles that just makes it look like a little creature. Um, Super common, super common. But um, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna wait and work on putting together a, a wavy tank, a little, you know, something with like a real oscillating current. I had a I had a pretty good collection going for a little while, um, but then I gave a bunch away because uh, uh, gorgonians can be a pain in the sense that uh, when you're trying to get flow everywhere. Yeah. They will essentially grow up and just be right into that flow and cut everybody else out of the picture. Yeah. Um, so you really need almost like a dedicated tank, which I would do very flat, low profile rock work, right? Mm. Let the Gorgonians yes, fill in the space. Almost no rock work, just yeah. only enough rock to attach them to. Yep. Uh, and then, you know, space them around adequately so you can get some flow in there. Uh, I think. Like what Julian did is a good approach with him where you're getting a wave action because mm -hmm. you're moving the whole body of water versus like yep. trying to shoot a nozzle of current through. Um, but yeah, I had grooves. I had, you know, your regular uh, purple. Um, you're going to you're going to school me on the Latin names, but uh, no, no, just your typical like purple uh, sea whip, I guess, is what you would call it from sea a common. Yeah, they, uh, have, they have they need they're they are. Uh, they need a little bit of marketing yeah. uh, strategy behind them because they're called what, a sea whip, slit pour, sea rod. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot more room there. I got but, the big um, meaty brown guy with the big polyps you were talking about. Um, that one I still have. Um, but, yeah. It, and they're not easy to propagate. No. Right? you got to cut them, and then you got to sheath you have to unsheath like some of the tissue oh, yeah. off, the, off the, the internal skeleton or that, you know, that chitinous skeleton. And then you got to put that in a hole and secure it. It's not, it's not easy. And so that, that and the, there's not that many crazy colors to the sea fans, but you know, I think, I think the most underrated corals now are all the old school corals. You know, um, right now I've got that mangrove tank that has the two Kessel a 500 X's and I've got a wide variety of corals in there. Cause I really wanted to, to demonstrate, that uh yeah i can grow some acros three feet away from these lights and trees at the top at the same time but after i do that review video i'm going to clear out virtually everything in there except for the mangroves and um, pretty much do purple cap and the lang side purple rim i actually uh, picked up an, it's almost like karma right so right before right around the time i was setting up the studio i gave 
a really beautiful colony of purple rim uh, Langside Cap to a friend of mine, uh, Luis Rosa. You might have known him from the scene. Yeah, I, I, I've been to his house. Um, yep. Oh, man. I, I, he's out of the he, hobby, I think, right? No, no, no. He's, he's, he's back in it. So I gave it to him just like two years ago. He's just like he just keeps to himself, does his own thing. So what's funny is that this was not a trade. Yeah. I gave him a beautiful, like, looked almost exactly like the picture on the bottle of the uh, ecosystems um, reef solution, that, that jug. looked ex almost exactly like that. I gave him that. And then he gave me, like, a jumbo colony of Monoporus satosa, which I still have, and it's even bigger now. But yesterday, I was over at my uh, uh, good buddy's house, Evan Montgomery, and we did some bushwhacking, and we hacked out a bunch of uh, Milka Purple Stylo, uh, some Orange Cap, some Monopora Hispida. That's a light brown with bright green polyps. Um, ORAs had it available for a really long time. And then just like a beautiful picturesque colony of scrolling purple rim cap that I gave him about a year and a half to two years ago. So I'm going to clear out the mangrove tank and I'm just going to grow a giant colony of orange cap and Langside purple rim. Nice. Reminds me of the, uh, is it the Omaha Zoo? They've got that shallow um, reef lagoon with the mangroves and they, I think they have some pretty intense cap growth in that tank as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a good message, right? Uh, if you're if you're getting discouraged by the crazy prices and the Instagram pictures, and you want to set up a nice tank, just go look at the greatest hits, right? It's kind of like music, right? Like there, there's good yes. music in the '70s and '80s, Absolutely. right? Just go go and check that stuff out. We're not. The only thing is, the only difference is like species are forever until yeah. we extinctify them. But it's maybe a scale. And a presentation problem, you yep. know. Um, oh, let's get back to the digis. We yeah. didn't touch upon the digis. Another thing I hacked out of his tank was like a big chunk of I call it kind of a peach peach orange digi. Yeah, you call it the pink. I well, I I just refer to it as orange digitata, but I've seen it like be be pinkish. I've seen it be. It's usually just overlit when it's kind of pink. Yeah, but yeah, that's a, that's a one coral. Like you just you can't give it too much light well, as no. long as you acclimate it and it'll just be so freaking bright so yeah i've uh i've been collecting some purple digitata uh the peach orange digitata and um it's it's again it's about that presentation if you have blue lights purple digi is not for you but if you can you know have at least a period of bright daylight spectrum lighting um during your your tank so you don't have to totally give it up Right? That's the thing with the older lights. You had to either choose blue or choose white. And now with the multicolor LEDs, you can have both. Right, So all my tanks uh, are basically you know, daylight spectrum for a good chunk in the middle of the day with really deep, long sec deep blue sections um, at the beginning and the end of the photo period. Um, but yeah, purple digitata, peach digitata, and you know, this is kind of cool. There's a, I think it's a red digitata infected with green fluorescent protein that people call grafted. And I think some of the frags of the purple digitata that I got, um, I think from boom corals, I was just checking them out last night and I saw a little bit of green in them. Nice. But yeah, those two corals, um, just a regular, perfectly presented uh, uh, peach digitata and the purple digitata, I mean, all time favorites. Don't get me wrong, I, I think a forest fire digi is beautiful too when it's fully grown out. It, How much you want? I have so much of it. <laughs> like, I have so much of it that it, that, that it grows out and just kind of self frags. You know what to do with the frags? What? Uh, calcium reactor the, media? No, even better. <laughs> I throw them back in the colony. Oh, nice. <laughs> Because it can grow really lanky, but I just kind of throw them back in so it just gets denser and denser. And, well, uh, sorry, go ahead. No, yeah, occasional visitors. Are like, hey, you got any pieces of that? I'm like, how much you want? <laughs> uh, how much you want? <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, I like uh, if you really get it growing good, it's it's like uh, reminds me of like stalagmites. Stalagmites, is that what they're called in the caves? You know, they're just they uh, stalactites fall stalactites mites rise oh maybe i had it right then because they grow up right but uh yeah, stalagmites um yeah it's just a cool growth it's a cool color you can get them in a variety of colors um and to me it's funny like when i talked about my acro getting pissed off because my alkalinity dropped to four Montiparas for me are like the perfect uh another it's like you're like a test kit in your tank because Montiparas. In my experience, I've never had good luck with them at high alkalinity. Mm. Um, they really seem to thrive at like seven. And once I get up into the nines and tens, 
Um, and this also seems to directly correlate with, I think, um, your 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 carbon load, I think, is it? Or your, um, basically, like, if you've got, like, a sand bed or something, like, you've got a lot of bacteria that are consuming some of the carbonates, um, then you can sort of get away with a higher level. But anyway, point being in my tank, when my orange digi gets pissed off, usually it's that my alkalinity is starting to creep up too high, and then I bring it back down, and it's happy. It's weird. That's so funny you should mention that, because for me, I've almost always used uh, Montiporos as a proxy for magnesium levels. Mm. For sure. Like, anytime somebody tells me or asks me a question about, you know, how to make their Montes better, I'm like, bump your magnesium. It's probably low, you know? Um, and I can, I've, I've, I've always kind of noticed that, and I now have a, a tank with a substantial population of Montiporos, or as you say it very so eloquently, Montiporos. <laughs> <laughs> That's the scientific pronunciation uh, for those of you that are uninitiated. Um, yeah, usually from a, a magnesium drop, but... But yeah, I mean, there's a huge range of SPS corals. I mean, even uh, stylos. I mean, just regular green stylos, pink stylos, milka stylophora. Those are bulletproof corals, you know, to grow right alongside your your uh, purple digis and your peach digis. But yeah, I think that there's been pink a stylo bit too much. under daylight spectrum. Yeah, <laughs> I actually um, very recently I kind of went through a, a stretch where I try to collect every strain I could get my hands on. I think I have nine different strains. I got pink, milka, green, super green, pink with green, and like kind of a, a the ocean, that's what they call, they used to call it the ocean polyp one. Um, so I've got two kind of rainbowy ones and then I've done a couple more. So yeah, like Pasloporids, so bird's nest, stylos, Pasloporos, man, just, just super cool corals. And then, I mean, I know people are always trying to get like the best of everything, you know, that's, that's kind of, I guess, normal, but like your entry level orange cycloceros disc corals, I mean, yeah, okay, you can get, like, the one that has, like, a little bit of green streaks through it or, you know, a little bit on that lemon yellow side. But at the end of the day, like, you're not really going to notice that difference so much unless you have them together. Yeah. Um, uh, just just orange cycloceros should be revered. Just, just such a cool coral, even neon green. Um, I guess we could go on and on, but I don't think I missed any major groups. Do you? I'm like, I'm like literally looking over through the tanks of what's underrated. And it's kind of fun that like even pectinias have had their moment and all the deep water acros have had their moment. What about and orange herpolitha? Have you seen that orange ever? Orange tongue coral. Um, again, those are because they're not, there's another thing, right? With the hype is if you can't like immediately turn around and frag it and have a decent looking frag to sell, that's one of the things that contributes or takes away from uh, the esteem of certain coral groups. But yeah, orange tongue coral, super cool. Um, the live aquaria has got a uh, orange sandalolitha that just happens to have like little red tips to the tentacles. I know that, not, not trying to bring Julian up here all the time, but he has like the greatest collection of underrated corals of all time. I mean, branching Leptoceras. Um, he's got two different uh, orange tongue corals. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's every every coral, man, every single coral. It, it, that, here's the thing. Here's kind of some one of my closing arguments. The funnest part of, especially the corals, right? Like the fish, you know what you're going to get. A blue tang is going to be a blue tang. A royal grandma is going to become a royal grandma. But almost every coral in average condition at the local fish store, it's almost like a personal challenge to dial in its perfect condition, whether that's placement or nutrients or lighting. And when you f see it finally blossom, whether it takes like a month or two years, that is so freaking rewarding. Especially if you got that coral for like 10 bucks. <laughs> well, and there's, uh, to me, some of the beauty is the longevity of it, where when you see a tank where the corals are big and grown in, and the guy had to remove corals to let the uh, cor other corals keep growing, there's something really majestic and cool about it. And whenever I see a tank that's like, 20 years old and so it's full of the greatest hits right it's not greatest full of like, like the newest i think 
if there's any coral vendors listening, somebody needs to like, like go ahead and sell your thousand dollar mushroom, you know, and frags over here. But you should create like a a section called like greatest hits and just put like some of these corals that are more common, more affordable there. Um, mm-hmm. Anyway, I digress. But um, when you see, you know, like they, they bought a lot of those corals a long time ago, so they don't have the latest, hottest, coolest thing. But these corals are mature. They're grown in. He's hacking crap back all the time. And there's something so majestic about that. Like I could stare at a tank like that all day long versus like, again, I mean, I know we harp on this a lot, but frags are frags of LE corals are cool. But, um, I mean, I guess we got to wait a while to see what, you know, see who, who's going to grow that thing out for 10 years and make it look gorgeous. Or are you going to lose interest in it because you're going to move on to the next shiny new thing, right? Like, um, corals require patience i think you know like if you buy a coral i mean you take like the favia you brought up right like it's going to take five years for that thing to be 12 inches big and round and you know looking you'll amazing enjoy it along the way you know? yeah even when it's two to five inches it's going to be neon green with bright red polyps right bright, bright red mouths but i think there's definitely um you know i think a lack of daylight spectrum that is affecting um, the rating of a lot of these corals, as well as scale, because uh, you know a, a green slimer is is very colorful, but you're not going to appreciate it until you can almost put your hands around it. And don't get me wrong; those those crazy highlighter corals will probably look amazing when they're it. grown out. But I don't. There's not a lot of examples of that, right? I yeah. mean, um, yeah, yet, absolutely. yet, but yeah, that um, is that is the beauty of a lot of these underrated corals. It just makes it so much easier and affordable for me to pick them up for a song and a dance. Dude, everywhere I go, every time I'm putting on some of these underrated corals, I, you know, they'll give them to me or they'll, you know, like 10, 20 bucks just to get them out of the way, right? Um, people want to talk about, um, I, I, I want to do a total different episode on the price versus value of corals. So I don't want to get into it too, too much. But um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of underrated fish, corals, and inverts that are very affordable in the reef aquarium hobby and there's i mean literally thousands of species and strains to pick from and uh uh, i hope we've kind of uh, jostled people's um radar i hope Um, yeah i hope people that are maybe just getting into it they may not be able to identify every coral or or relate every name of coral that we've talked about like to a picture in their head but you know i would I look at some of these hobbies, hobbyists that are new to the game, getting into it and jumping on and seeing some of these coral prices or seeing like some of these trends. And I just, I, you know, I hope some of them kind of take home that message of like, get some common corals that have been around the block or like are, are, were revered back in the day that are, you know, everybody's using them for calcium reactor media or something now. And just put them in your tank and just grow the shit out of them, right? Like just <laughs> just make your tank stable and happy and amazing. Put put a freaking royal grandma in there and some cool That's... underappreciated fish. And then just let the thing grow and take care of it. I'm telling you, like, you know, you, at the one-year, two-year mark, like you said, you'll enjoy, enjoy the journey, right? It's not about the destination, yeah. but... You'll get to a point like five years in where you're still looking at a thing, and it's just this awesome thing. Yeah. And I don't know. It will outlast your girlfriends. <laughs> 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 Before I got married, uh, there I described certain corals as like three girlfriends ago, five girlfriends ago. <laughs> I, I always um, joke with my daughter who's 10. I, I point at corals in my tank. I'm like, that coral's older than that, or that coral's uh, been with me longer than you. <laughs> you know? <laughs> All right, I think we're going to have to put a pin in it now. I think we yeah. really kind of covered the, the topic of underrated marine life in the aquarium hobby. Um, I really wanted to thank everybody for tuning in. If you are watching this on YouTube and you have any specific topics that you want us to cover, now's a good time to alert us to those. And I'm a little bit new to this podcasting thing, but I listened to it enough, so I'm pretty sure uh, you'll help us out by rating us in your favorite podcatcher. And uh, anything else you want to say, Mark? No, I'm, I'm stoked that we've got that podcast format for Spotify and hopefully soon iTunes. I, I know that's how I digest a lot of material because uh, I'm always just busy. 
yeah. running around chasing my kids or running. So it's kind of nice, you know, we're driving to work, you can put it on the background and listen to this harp about stuff. And, um, so I think that's, that's cool. Uh, and I did read a lot of comments of people wanting that. So that's great. Um, and yeah, we yeah. took a nice lar- hard left turn into the livestock end of things, you know, and we'll, we'll, we're going to keep it balanced, right. On a very long timeline, we're yeah. going to kind of cover a little bit of everything. Um, but Mark, this one's for you. I want you to uh, think of a couple topics that you want to spearhead uh, in the future in this uh, weekly sessions of the Reef Therapy Program. Okay, I, ch- I accept your challenge. Uh, thank you so much for participating in this with me, and uh, we'll do it up again next week. See you guys. All right, later, dudes.